Nancy Calderon from the Coordination and Evaluation Center at UCLA. Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to the January 2020 Diversity Program Consortium webinar. Uh, before we formally start with the, uh, the webinar this month, I'd like to make sure we address a few logistical aspects of the webinar. Um, as you can see on your screen, the um, title for today's uh, presentation is The Science of Effective Mentorship in STEM, uh, where they will highlight uh, from the recent National Academies of Press report. And um, some of the uh, way we will run today's webinar include uh, making sure that we monitor the audio uh, on the GoToMeeting functions here. And uh, we kindly ask that you please mute your phone and or microphone in case you're joining from your desktop computer so that we can prevent sound disruptions. Uh, similarly, if you need to attend to another call or receive another call, we kindly ask that you end this call and that you call us back. Otherwise, we might be able to, um, we might have to end the webinar because we will be hearing your hold music. Um, in terms of how we will manage questions for today's speakers, we will be um, welcoming your questions through the GoToMe chat box and uh, that will feed into a Q&A uh, bank at the end of their presentation. Once we are done with the question bank, um, we'll open the floor to those who are here by phone only, and um, we will make sure that um, everybody gets an opportunity to um, unmute themselves, or we will do that as well as needed. This meeting is being recorded. The slides will be made available via the internet for future reference, and um, the um, recording link will also be available to you um, through the web, uh, through the YouTube portal. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Cynthia Joseph. She is the Director of the Coordination and Evaluation Center's Communication and Dissemination Core, and will serve as our moderator for today's webinar. Dr. Joseph, the time is yours. Thank you so much for joining. I see that we are um, uh, continuing to receive callers, so I'm very excited to welcome you today to uh, our webinar. Uh, we are celebrating a National Mentoring Month during the uh, month of January, and uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to feature the National Academy's press report, The Science of Effective Mentorship in STEM. Uh, we are hosting today three of the committee members uh, that were uh, involved in the production of that report. A uh, fourth member who uh, was uh, Dr. Angela uh, 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 Byers Winston uh, was the chair and, and she was unable to attend today during, due to uh, travel, but Dr. Sylvia Hurtado, Dr. Uh, Rick McGee, and Dr. Chris Fund are going to give us a, an exciting overview of the findings of this report. And I'm delighted to see that we are currently at 82 members, 83. Um, that's very, uh, very exciting. So I want to welcome all of you that are new to the Diversity Program Consortium uh, webinar series. And uh, we are going to be hosting this uh, webinar recording on our homepage uh, probably within a week. So give us a little bit of time to get that up and we will be sure to let uh, send out the location of that to all of you who have received this information uh, through uh, some forwarded lists other than uh, in the Diversity Program Consortium. While you're there on our home page, please check us out. It uh, kind of gives a short introduction to who we are, which I don't have time for today, but we are funded by the National Institutes of Health and are delighted to have you here. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass off to Dr. Sylvia Hurtado, who will be our first speaker. Dr. Hurtado? Good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm very excited today to present the National Academy of Science, uh, Engineering, uh, Mathematics, uh, and Medicine, of course, uh, uh, report uh, that uh, was recently released. Uh, and really to say that, you know, we're, we're really pleased to say a lot of the work that's part of uh, that was featured in this report actually comes from the D Diversity Program Consortium and the work that's been funded uh, over recent years. So let me go ahead and go. Uh, but my co-presenters, uh, Dr. Christine Fund and Rick McGee, 
uh, are also members of the Diversity Program Consortium and, uh, and were uh, uh, strong members of the committee that I'll talk about in one moment. Next slide. So here's our report. It's great to see it in press finally. Uh, as members of the committee, we have been working on it uh, tirelessly and to see this component. Well, we will talk about an online version uh, at the end of the, um, the webinar. And basically this was really part of our task is to actually make some of the reports from the National Academies uh, actually more interactive and useful for a variety of audiences. The next uh, slide. So I want to start with the, just briefly, uh, because I think there was some controversy as we know that there's mentoring in science, but is there a science of mentorship? And we want to say uh, definitively uh, that there is, and this report actually establishes that. If science is thought as an intellectual and practical activity in, in, in encompassing many systematic study of structures, behaviors through uh, experiment, research, uh, and theory and observation, then really we have done that uh, when we are thinking about the broad findings that have emerged over the last couple of decades on, on mentorship. So the science of mentorship brings together multiple disciplinary perspectives from organizational and social psychology, all, as well as discipline-based education that happens in many fields. Um, it provides guidance uh, for effective behaviors, theoretical frameworks. This is actually giving a little preview of the report. We have measures, assessment techniques, their mentoring tools that have developed that are in use. Um, and also, we're gonna talk a little bit about the different structures of mentoring relationship. And then finally, the role of institutional support. Um, and so we were able to document a lot of these issues. So before I go there, I wanna talk a little bit about the committee in the next slide. Oh, our overview. So I, I will talk about um, basically, we're, we'll be covering how the project was conducted, what is mentorship, I'll go in, uh, further into definition. Um, Rick McGee will talk about the identities that affect men mentorship uh, in STEM and also disciplinary contexts that affect mentorship um, and the role of mentorship in medical education. Um, then we're also turning to works and what works in times of programmatic uh, mentorship and what the role of the institution is in overseeing the kinds of mentorship that occur so that we come to our recommendations on creating a culture of effective mentorship. Next slide. So how was the project conducted? Um, the statement of task really was provided by the Board of Higher Education and, and Workforce, which is a standing uh, work group of the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine. And the BHEW, or the Board of Higher Education and Workforce, is intended to provide policymakers, academic leaders, and business executives with insight and recommendations on critical higher education and workforce issues facing the nation. So basically, I wanna say that it, it, a lot of the reports that you've seen, uh, I, I think there are up to 10 that have happened since the late 1980s, 1990s on STEM, actually are part of the task of this study committee uh, that's within the National Academies of Science. And uh, some of the studies are congressionally mandated, in which case it's referred to study within the National Academy of Science and National Research Council to provide guidance. This particular study was funded by private um, foundations and I'll get to uh, that in a minute. Um, so in a sense then, um, the way this started was really conversations within the Board of Higher Education and the workforce about uh, sort of the next issues that are really important in STEM education and the workforce. And emerging from the discussion um, was really a focus on mentoring as a form of talent development. Um, but, and while actually we've known about mentoring for many years and since the ages, it's been a part of training uh, and a form of talent development, 
we probably have not had a, a summary, an overview of effective mentoring and how it is practiced in higher education. So Angela byers Winston, who's a member of the Board of Higher Education and the Workforce from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, was asked to chair, given this is one of her areas of, uh, uh, of, of research, obviously, um, and to chair the committee and uh, members were selected nationally uh, to really create a consensus panel of experts known as the Committee on Science for Effective Mentoring and charged with authoring this report. So we are one indebted to our leadership and the expertise across the committee that was convened for this particular study. And there were three main guiding questions that led this uh, to conduct this study. Now, I want to say something about our scope. It was focused on undergraduate and graduate levels though there's actually a lot of research and uh, programs directed at postdocs and faculty, our focus was really on undergraduate and graduate levels. Um, uh, they wanted to know more about a common definition or differentiation in terms of models of what's going on in STEM and mentoring. The most successful elements we're able to identify in terms of effective mentoring according to what the research said recognizing that mentoring occurs at various stages of career development, and then really thinking about how can mentees or, and mentors be trained in effective uh, mentor to create a mentor-mentee uh, relationship that's really effective and results in important talent development outcomes. So in addition to the final report, as I said, the committee was also tasked with creating an online guide for institutions, departments, and faculty members who want to learn more or work interactively. This is the first of its kind from the National Academy, and so we're very proud about that accomplishment. Um, the next slide. So here is the committee of experts, and I have to say I've been on four consensus panel reports for the National Academies, and this was probably the most enjoyable. Um, and I think it a lot had to do with the wonderful leadership of Angela, Angela Byers Winston, but also the experts uh, that were working and are very committed to understanding uh, mentorship, but also how it's enacted, and particularly as it relates to the mentorship of underrepresented groups in STEM. And so this is our committee. I won't list all of them, but obviously. Some of you may recognize the names from many, many initiatives as well as uh, research in the field. Next slide. So how was the project conducted? Well, generally for all consensus panel uh, meetings is we are to synthesize, summarize the research, but we also held about 18 listening sessions on university campuses and professional society meetings we also called together particular experts that were not on the committee to really uh, tell us about their most recent research in the area of mentoring and what direction it was headed. We also commissioned three literature reviews because this is uh, quite a bit a uh, large area. Um, and so uh, those uh, reports are actually uh, embedded in both the online and, um, and also the, the national report. Uh, so you can actually see it's a great resource in terms of synthesis of what we know. Um, we also convened three public workshops across the country, and this is where we also brought the additional experts and brought key stakeholders, policymakers uh, to come and hear, and we wanted to hear, uh, hear each other, but also hear them about what were the issues that were most important or that were emerging in mentorship that we could include in this report. So uh, we actually then uh, gathered evidence from the scholars, the practitioners, uh, about the study uh, of the practice of mentorship. And so that was really enlightening to see and hear and understand many, many groups in higher education and, uh, and industry are interested in, um, in this uh, topic. Next. So how was the project conducted? The committee sought to uh, understand the current state of the science and mentorship. That is, what is it we know? Um, what is it that we are still, uh, we have yet to know? Uh, that is, there's not uh, consistent evidence yet, but we'd like to uh, receive more. And so potential areas for re future research on mentorship uh, are uh, uh, outlined in this report. Uh, and then, of course, 
The other component was really providing mentors and mentees and mentoring program directors with evidence-based knowledge and skills necessary to ensure uh, productive and sustainable mentoring relationships. So I think the report, I'm very excited because I think it's very useful and it really tells us about the state of the art. Next slide. So um, the committee went round and round about what is mentorship and we settled on a definition. Um, and basically we are um, trying to close this. Okay, it's not doing that, okay. Um, so mentorship is a professional working alliance in which individuals work together over time to support the personal and professional um, development and success. Uh, so basically we talk about mentorship as being a relational um, kind of process. Um, and so the success of the racial, relational partners happens through the provision of career and so psychosocial support. That is the recognition that it is relational rather than uh, hierarchical. There, it is much more of a social exchange process. I think we, we settled on that. Um, and uh, the um, mentorship includes a variety. In fact, there are, when you think about the variety of ways that mentors have worked with mentees over time, there are a variety of career support functions, but also psychosocial support functions. So we didn't want to focus on one or the other. And there are even, uh, for example, understanding of how to navigate you know, political systems and uh, educational um, hierarchies, et cetera, are part of understanding this mentorship. So it's aimed at, uh, all aimed at mentee talent development. Um, we, we do wanna say that we didn't spend as much time, there's a lot of work on processes like teaching and coaching, but we really wanted to focus, and it's certainly related to that because mentoring is a form of teaching and coaching, obviously, but we really wanted to focus on that work that was more focused on the mentoring as it's been defined in the literature um, and efforts to support uh, development of knowledge and skills and thinking about the holistic development of STEM professionals, including their identity um, as STEM researchers, practitioners, professionals. And so uh, this may be a little bit different of a uh, definition that you're used to, but we really want it to be more uh, broadly inclusive of really the varying definitions that are emerging and its a relational nature. Next slide. So what is mentorship? There are some key elements we identified in the literature. One, of course, is trust. Uh, thinking about how you develop trust uh, between mentors and mentees as they work together and respond to needs and priorities. And uh, some of these, which the needs and priorities change over time and though that therefore require also change in relationships. So I think it's important to really think about Mentorship is a relationship that is based on trust. Another component is really self-reflection, which is really not a, not a common thing that faculty to do <laughs> very often, but we do want to encourage the mentors and mentees really think about critical and honest self-reflection at multiple stages of the mentoring relationship. And so um, there are tools for this, and we'll talk a little bit about them, and I'm sure we have them in our online uh, component as well. But the self-reflection is becoming more and more important to really think about how is the relationship working, our needs being met, and uh, more importantly, how expectations are being met. So expectations, um, and I think the, um, the state of the art or the mode of operation now is to be much more explicit about expectations at the start and throughout the mentoring uh, relationship, uh, at, in, at both at the initiation and also periodically. And there are tools to begin to record these in writing uh, to help to create an effective mentorship. Uh, because I think one of the key, at least downfalls of an ineffective relationship is uh, unmet expectations and more importantly unreasonable expectations in the process. So really thinking about the steps in one's development actually has to go hand in hand with expectations. 
Then I think the important thing, and I'm hoping that um, the report and some of what we present today is going to shake up your, your view of mentoring a little bit, because I think we try to push the envelope in that area, was really, can mentorship be learned? And we conclude definitively, based on the research, based on practice, that mentorship is a learned skill. Uh, and mentorship education has an impact and influences uh, mentor and mentees uh, uh, understanding and actually outcomes. Um, and so the, the, I think the main takeaway we have from this report, it can be learned. And I think uh, it's a lot, the analogy is with teaching, is there some natural teachers? Well, there might be some natural mentors, but I think for most of us, we actually can learn throughout our careers how to become better mentors and also to help our mentees. So I'll take the next slide. Another component of this is to really think of mentorship is really going through a series of stages. Now it can be short term, but I know there are a lot of programs that are kind of, I would say, um, one time or short, very short interventions um, and, that, and we call them mentoring. Well, we want to think of mentorship as being a more extended kind of relationship that may go through various stages from initiation to cultivation to really having mentees uh, go on to their career, that is the separation, but also then redefining that relationship because in many professional and uh, workplace and you know, workforce requirements over the lifetime of one's career, one relates to and goes back again, again, and again to mentors uh, for advice and for understanding and formulates new mentors uh, as a result. So I think, uh, I think it's important to really think about it as being in stages and how we support those various stages rather than thinking about uh, one-time kinds of things and hoping that relationships will develop. So we need to really think about ongoing collaboration and discussions are key to really kind of sustaining this over time as being effective and assuring that it is responsive, the relationship is responsive to the needs and goals and interests of both mentors and mentees as they change through their career and their relationship. Next slide. Ah. Perhaps one of the other ways we're kind of, we want to kind of break or shake, shake it up a little bit is to really expand our thinking about mentor and mentorship. And one, we have one chapter, it's uh, uh, primarily in, in chapter two, um, that really looks at the range of structures um, and later chapters that looks at the range of structures that are enacted. Most of us think of it as a dyad as the mentor and mentee and focus on that relationship. But we're actually finding that there are, are very often uh, mentees have multiple mentors for various uh, components. Some might be psychosocial, others might be career support, um, et cetera. And so there are, it may be more common to have triads and that's developing as people progress in their careers. Um, another is really thinking about um, particularly in the research uh, uh, environment, to really think about a collective or group of mentors working with a group of mentees and ensuring that there is a relationship uh, across the mentors and across the mentees, as well as with each of the mentors in the collective or work group, particularly in a research environment. And then there's also a broader network uh, view of thinking about mentor-mentee relationships and that there are multiple mentors that might be uh, in relation to mentees. Some mentors have additional uh, social networks that lead to resources. Sometimes there's direct connections with a variety of resources. Now we're also saying there are professional societies that have mentorship. There are uh, a range of other kinds of organizations that are also resource-based that also employ mentorship as a component uh, to ensure access uh, to resources for mentees. And I want to say one thing that I probably neglected, but it kind of leads into our next component we'll talk about in a minute, 
is one of the major concerns was the extent to which the opportunities for mentorship are not equally distributed. And uh, this is what happens when we allow these uh, kinds of relationships to be informal. Um, and of course, the typical has been for mentors to uh, men, uh, mentor actually people that are most like them. A major concern of the report was really the importance of uh, mentoring underrepresented groups and give them access to quality mentoring. So that was a major focus of both the task and also of the report. Um, and at this point, I think the next slide, uh, turn it over to Rick McGee. Oh, I'm sorry, I do one more. Um, that is, the notion is, and there's developing research area on ineffective practice, that is what's called negative mentoring experiences. And um, we've seen a lot of these in our departments, if we're faculty in the workplace, if we are noticing uh, who advances, who doesn't, obviously. So mentorship becomes less effective when mentors are absent, when there are unrealistic expectations, when there's no clear or relevant guidance. And of course, there's also uh, manipulative behavior uh, that occurs, including inappropriate uh, work relationships or even taking credit for a mentee's work. So some of these have been documented. This is a continuing and developing area in the research literature. Um, and some negative experiences may occasionally arise from ill intent, uh, but can also arise from otherwise good intentions, not realizing that attention to mentorship really requires, requires attention to the relationship. Um, there are some abusive supervision and harassment, obviously, that are detrimental and require institutional intervention. And we will conclude with a little bit of some of that uh, institutional oversight uh, and accountability that's necessary in mentorship relationships. Now we'll turn it over to Rick McGee. Thanks very much, Sylvia. I assume I can be heard okay, at least it was before. Um, yes. And thanks to everyone for taking the time to, okay, thanks for everyone to take the time to come and hear kind of a summary of what we what we went through. And as, as Sylvia pointed out, it's an amazing experience for all of us to work together <clears throat> with you know so many people who are, this is their, their core research and their core interest. So moving on a little bit more into terms of kind of what's happening during a mentoring relationship and what um, you know what research you know, there is about that. That uh, you know, I think the starting point is to really understand that mentoring and mentoring relationships are social relationships. They may be kind of uh, devoted to science and technology and areas, but the actual relationship themselves are very uh, very social. <clears throat> and as such, the you know when you get into social relationships, all of a sudden identities play a really critical role in the formation and development of all these social relationships. Yeah, and, and the research is actually very strong in terms of a lot of research has looked at science identity and the intersection between the identities associated with science and the identities associated to one's cultures. You know, and the linkage between those two are, you know, the evidence is very strong in terms of both academic and career development and the experience of mentoring relationships in, in STEM. Um, the the, you know, the the other thing that came out in the literature is that high quality mentorship can actually ameliorate some of the negative effects for <clears throat> excuse me for students who really do feel kind of outside or othered because of their uh, cultural identities, which are not necessarily seen you know oftentimes in their uh, experiences within you know teaching and learning and doing research. So mentorship can really has a strong potential effect on establishing inclusion. So rather than someone just being present, they actually are really included and being part of the actual uh, experiences and the and science that's going on. So next slide, please. The, you know, when you get into identities, then all of a sudden you move into the idea of how does the, you know, how does the mentoring take into account those identities and the whole, and the actual culture. You know, and so we moved into the idea of the importance of culturally responsive mentoring. Yeah, you know, and it's just as the baseline concept of mentoring as a, as a developed and learned skills, culturally responsive mentoring also is a learned set of skills and clear evidence that it is something that it is, is learned. And it really goes across the aspects of all elements 
of, of people who are, you know, serving roles as mentors. So everyone really has a responsibility to kind of develop that skill to maximize the value for the mentees, which is the purpose of the mentoring relationship um, primarily. Um, the what's interesting though, and we you know, is that many times people have feel that there needs to be a clearer connection and clear shared identities such as racial or gender identity, but the actual research is quite ambivalent in terms of the degree to which that's essential for high quality mentoring relationships. Certainly it can be conducive, it can be additive, but there actually are many evidence and much research showing it doesn't necessarily have to be concordance between the gender or racial um, uh, identities of the mentor and the mentees. So I think that was an important kind of conclusion that we, we came to looking at everything that's been done. The, but it's clearly the, you know, in the absence of culture or mentorship, there can be creation of what's referred to as identity interference, where all of a sudden it's the, <clears throat> the how I'm seen and how I see myself as a scientist or in science can be quite different from the uh, cultural experience or the cultural identities and that the value of the culturally responsive mentoring is to, again, ameliorate that. So people don't feel like when they walk in, if they're coming from, if a culture is part of them, they kind of have to check their culture at the door because that just really isn't part of, of being a whole person within the STEM setting. Um, and the, you know, because the cultural identity really has been shown to have some strong influence on, on both mental health and uh, academic progression, so it's really critical to have mentoring relationships that can counter, you know, uh, senses of identity interference. Um, this is one area where, you know, the affinity-based mentorship groups, when we've talked a little bit about mentoring groups, we'll talk a little more about that, but here's where the affinity-based groups can play a great uh, an additive role, because not all, no matter how well we help people become effective mentors, they will know one person can ever, you know, even hope or should even try to provide all of the roles, all the supports that each of us needs. So again, here's where affinity groups can be a very strong role that they can play as well beyond what just individual mentors may be able to contribute. Next slide, please. The, the other thing that is, is really, we, the committee spent a lot of time kind of wrestling with is this idea of the <clears throat> mentoring and the concept and the, and the context. You know, and we tend to think of largely uh, the, re the context of research is research mentoring. You know, and so, what, but when you get into research mentoring, all of a sudden you have some conflated potential connection between, well, am I an advisor or am I a mentor, am I a supervisor? And so you actually can have some of the roles and the context of mentoring beginning to kind of uh, kind of trip on each other. <clears throat> and you can walk across between Right, we talk a lot in the report about formal versus informal mentoring in some of these constructs. But the, you know, you know, many times the even research mentees will choose an advisor, research advisor, who may not have a lot of of the connections with them socially and culturally. You know, and so sometimes those are there, or sometimes they're not. And as Silver pointed out, the incredible importance of trust and responsiveness and effective relationships. And even if that isn't their in the beginning because they don't know each other very well, it is something that can grow. So it isn't you have to think about mentoring as this is a static that, well, you have it or you don't. No, these are all about relationships that grow and evolve and change just as all other relationships do. do. Um, but the, you know, that, you know, again, not all uh, mentoring is research mentoring. And that's why even some of the diagrams that uh, you know that Sylvia pointed to before, and we'll talk about more, it isn't all about research mentoring. So again, you've got the research mentoring, you have other kind of mentoring that's taking place. So it's kind of the integration of all these mentoring relationships that individuals are able to take advantage of. But each of them have their you know their the, you know, limitations and abilities to try to maximize that there can be um, you know the best they can possibly be. Next slide. Now, one of the, uh, um, you know, as you can see, and we wrestled how to bring it in, we finally end up with just having another M on the end of STEM for medical. So one of the roles that we did want to look at is what is known about mentorship in medical education. And, and again, here, as, you know, sort of pointed out, we are boundaries for our report was really looking at undergraduate and graduate, and a medical school equivalent would be the undergraduate and during medical school. 
so that's again the boundaries that we looked at um, <clears throat> and I think the you know is you know uh, again the importance of mentoring and mentoring relationships many times is particularly intense at times of transition and so the transitions from undergraduate to medical school or say to an MD PhD program all of those transitions are the time where things people are most vulnerable going through all kinds of changes you know and so clearly having supports during any of those transition times are you know very critical and different um, programs and different uh, ways are, are kind of achieving that and that's also another place where multiple mentors are able to be particularly helpful in the transition point either preparing for it or then adapting once you get there so that clearly plays a role in in medicine particularly the transition from undergraduate you know experience up to medical school huge transition so where our mentors can you know play a particularly important role but in the in many respects so mentoring in medicine is quite different than mentoring for in in the research world largely also because in the in the medical world the actual admissions process you know for which the gatekeeping process is very structured it's a very systematized process and so you actually have to learn and you just essentially most of you know you apply to a system and then you you know the applications go out to different medical schools likewise the advising process for med uh, pre-medical is very different so you have it's a whole professions of uh, people who are pre-medical advisors so the information transfer about what you need to do and what you need to do next which is a key role in in, uh, in science mentoring a lot of that is the role of these professionals so again it's a systematized process more than an individual mentor process so it plays actually less a role in the pre-medical uh, preparation <clears throat> likewise in medicine <clears throat> the in the first four years the actual curriculum is very set you know and so it's much more of a systematized teaching and learning process so again, mentors are playing very little role actually in the teaching and learning process in undergraduate medica uh, med in, in medical education. And that's what we really found in the literature. There really is very little literature about um, um, mentoring in medicine. The counter to that is that when it does play a role, it's actually more in the career advising and the career uh, development or, uh, role of um, you know, medical students moving in their own profession so you know clearly the mentoring <clears throat> kicks in much more in the mdphc program during the phc phase but in medicine um uh, the evidence for you know mentoring playing a core role is much less than in research okay next slide please <clears throat> so here's one that is really um we again spend a lot of time uh, in terms of well where does mentoring happen mm -hmm. you know and there's there is, you know, a lot of it, what you've seen already is really focused on this very long lasting and strong relationship. <clears throat> but the reality is, is mentoring is actually happening in a lot of different places. So we didn't want to, you know, put too narrow a scope on what could be considered and what really then should be looked at from a research standpoint of where is the mentoring happening and how is it most effective. And this really comes into play in the, in what referred to as programmatic, programmatic mentorship which is absolutely critical to you know, the, uh, you know, the DPC for, for all the build programs to a large extent are really going through a, a, main spec, a programmatic mentorship. And so there, you know, we have decades worth of programs that have been designed you know, literally as an integration of a bunch of different elements. Um, there are large scale national institutes and the initiatives and the you know, build program is, is one of the most recent one of those. And all of them are judged by the you know uh, the effect of the outcomes so you know the outcome of the program to helping those being in the program get someplace so the research has tended to strictly really look at the outcome and it's been very difficult very few people have actually tried to do research on disaggregating these particular effects and you know, particularly disaggregating them into mentoring so quite honestly we really don't know much there isn't a lot of research on is it worth trying to dis disaggregate and look at specific elements of mentoring because it's such a complex system? Um, <clears throat> it's one of those things where people know it's happening, you know, and you know it's there and everyone knows it's important, but there isn't as much research on trying to disaggregate that out into its component parts. Um, but clearly, you know, the idea of the uh, programs uh, highlight vicarious learning, 
you know, and can be looked at from that standpoint. And some research has, has done that as well. And the you know, institutional support can to play a critical role in these programs as well, which I think takes us to the next slide, which is just that, the role of institutions. So, so we've really looked at, up to this point, is on the, the relationships, the individual connections, the skills of those in the, who are, are playing the roles of, of mentors, but these don't exist in a, in a vacuum. These all exist within an institutional setting. You know, and so clearly, as they were, we found in reports, um, and even in the recommendations, many of them really focus on the institution because the institution plays this critical role of enabling and making these relationships most, most possible and also you know, looking at them. Because again, as Sylvia pointed out, not all relationships, our mentoring relationships are, <clears throat> you know, are everything they should be. In a sense, institutions play a critical role in, in monitoring those in, in different ways. And again, it's all about the institution developing talent and human capital because that's the role of the institution because individual faculty can't really do much outside of the context of the, uh, of the uh, institution. Again, keeping in mind the institutional context <clears throat> that um, a high fraction of the mentors and even the mentees uh, you know, that are coming out in today's world are largely the kind of quintessential will be white, male, heterosexual, able-bodied, continuing generation, upper middle class individual. Now, that's changing some, particularly you know, at the younger stages, but still, that is the norm that all these things are taking place within the context of the institution. So next slide, please. So we really looked at <clears throat> trying to you know, make, you know, make explicit you know, what's, what, do we, what is seen as the role of the institution. You know, and I think uh, you know, I've been <laughs> in this business a long time, and the calls for why won't institutions recognize the value and the importance of mentoring. You know, I, I think I'm, I, I, I could say there's one of those common themes in life, and that's one of them in academia. And, and we really felt that that still is there. You know, it really is the role of the institution to recognize you know, the importance and to address barriers. You know, and some of those barriers are, barriers are time, resources, rewards and incentives, expertise, and, you know, and helping people develop the confidence to implement. So the institutions play really this role of allowing and encouraging and providing the space and resources for these skills to develop. And that's going to be the role that the institution has to play to, um, you know, to make things happen. Um, because again, you can't have every faculty member going off and trying to find out how do I develop skills to be an effective mentor or a culturally effective mentor. You know, it, it's going to be, you have to do that at the institutional level. So the next slide, <clears throat> you know, goes into kind of these, again, the more explicit, so how can institutions, and again, we've got down to the idea of mentorship education, access to tools, access to support, and kind of the acknowledgement of kind of setting the stage that all institutional leadership, and in some respects, especially at department chair level, really saying, this is important. This is something we all agree on. So essentially, you create a culture where everyone agrees this is important, agreeing, having highly skilled uh, mentoring, uh, mentors and relationships is critically important. And then using the data you know, and, uh, and ways of actually you know, helping people see what the differences are. And then, as I mentioned before, building kind of an error management or an error detection. When relationships are not working, it's up to institution to make sure that they have ways of recognizing and then doing something about it. Because mentees are inherently an incredibly vulnerable, low power position, and it's up to institutions to make sure that those, um, you know, those conditions are ameliorated and, uh, and dealt with. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to turn over to Chris to continue on with the recommendations and then to talk about the, you know, the really unique uh, web-based tools, which she was actually played a really instrumental role in developing. So I'll turn it over to Chris. So thanks for your time. Hi, Chris. Can you unmute?
Okay, uh, Chris is trying to unmute. We're going to pause here. Are you there? Rick, can sure. you go ahead and continue on this while she's, uh, thank you. Sure. <laughs> That's what you call a team, right? Here, let me throw the ball back. <laughs> Hot potato. Sure. Yeah. Well, while Chris is calling back in, <clears throat> just kind of an overview of the, um, you know, the uh, recommendations. And and really, the recommendations are, as the slide says, is how can we really create a culture of effective mentoring and effective mentorship? The, <clears throat> you know, the uh, first seven are really um, built around uh, participants in what we refer to as a mentorship ecosystem. And that's, I, I think, something to think about. It actually has some really good scientific roots in it, and that this is an ecosystem, you know, and all parts of it are contributing. You have individuals, you have groups, you have different species that are interacting with different levels of power and different level of control. And so a lot of it is happening here. <clears throat> and the final two sets of recommendations are really directed at agencies. Because again, the agencies are really a pretty critical role in this as well. I think for some of you are aware of the, you know, say for example, National Institute of General Medical Sciences in their last uh, you know, call for, you know, institutional training grants called T32, all of a sudden inserted some really strong new expectations of mentoring and mentoring relationships, which, you know, have uh, as you know, certainly has caught people's attention as uh, they're recognizing importance and now how to do something about it. So Chris, I hear you come back in. I am, sorry, for some reason I got blocked out of the audio control, uh, maybe I was on too long. All right, thanks so much okay. for uh, picking that up, Rick. So um, sure. so wanna give us a little time um, for Q&A and I know Cynthia wants to close us out. So I just wanna spend um, maybe about five minutes um, taking you through the top level recommendations. Um, and I won't go through the specific examples, but of course they'll be available in the slide set and then introduce you to the online toolkit. Um, I think as Sylvia said, is you know, it's incredible that so much of your work um, as leaders and um, educators and scholars in this arena are represented in this report um, and, um, and aligned with this report. So I think you know, as a DPC community, we should be really excited to read this report um, and be able to rate, use it as an opportunity to raise the visibility of things you're already doing across the BUILD and NRMN and the CEC um, in the world of mentorship, as well as leverage it um, to continue pushing towards change. Um, so on the next slide, um, and I'll just go through these rather quickly, um, uh, is uh, the first recommendation, and that is to adopt an operational definition of mentorship in STEM. And this is to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Um, so this is something you may want to consider um, at your own institutions. Um, I know this has um, been really exciting in terms of thinking about things. This may be also something we want to think about across the consortium, is what definitions are we using uh, in this second phase of the consortium? In the next recommendation on the next slide, this one is really focused on evidence-based approaches to mentorship. This is about promoting the use of guidelines, tools, expectations, assessments, and mentorship education for mentors and mentors. Obviously, this is a huge component of the BUILD projects. This is a huge focus of NRMN, both in its first phase and the Resource Center, um, and is a focus in the broadest uh, sense um, in terms of a lot of the interventions that are being tested rigorously in the NRMN research studies. So the next recommendation is really around assessment and evaluation and using structured feedback systems. This is a call for regular systematic review of relationships and as well as mentee and mentor uh, abilities. Um, this is also the place where there's a lot of work to do and I think the DPC can really help um, in what is out there in terms of assessments, like the report tried to capture some of that, and what else can we inform the nation about. Um, in terms of the tools that can be used, the tools we can test to help institutions and um, uh, programs assess uh, relationships and assess systems and ecosystems of mentorship. 
The next recommendation uh, is focused on identities and mentorship. Um, Rick, thanks for giving such a good overview of what the report spoke to. Um, this is a real call to many of the things that I know um, build programs have integrated. Um, obviously, the focus of uh, some of the culturally aware mentorship coming out of NRMN phase one, some of that work continuing uh, in the research studies um, and across many of them to really keep pushing the envelope on how do we help mentors and mentees to uh, address identities and to be more culturally responsive in those relationships and to reduce the impact of many of the negative factors that are influencing those relationships, such as things like um, stereotype threat, imposter syndrome, and many of the things I know you are working on. Uh, the next recommendation is about multiple mentorship. Uh, Sylvia did a nice job showing um, those structures. And again, I think this is a great way um, and a challenge to all of us across the consortium to really be able to draw out the structures that we are working to support and working to study so that we can talk to each other about those systems and talk about the individuals who we're intervening on and um, who we're assessing. Uh, the next recommendation, uh, number six, is about rewarding mentorship. Uh, Rick raised this. This is all very salient to many of us. Um, the great thing about this report is I think it's put some fire in this arena. Um, and so I'm really excited just even in, since the report's released, I've been traveling, um, giving talks um, on and consulting with institutions about this. And there are some really great ideas. Um, I want to put that I am not representing the committee in this, but I want to put a personal pitch that I really think we have an opportunity to think about rewarding effective mentorship, not just in the teaching and service domain, but really in the research domain where we know that mentorship is critical to success. Again, that was not um, the, uh, on the state committee, but I think there's an opportunity for us to talk about that. Um, number seven is focus and, uh, on the mitigating negative mentoring uh, experiences, and Sylvia did a nice job um, highlighting that um, in terms of what are we going to specifically do, um, and I think this is an area ripe for investigation and intervention. The last two recommendations are uh, directed at the funding agencies. Uh, the first um, is really um, that funding agencies can shape the values of institutions and projects. They can encourage and support effective mentorship practices. I think NIGMS has really uh, taken an amazing lead in that arena, and um, we look forward to continuing to see that type of leadership. The last one is about research projects and the scholarship of mentorship. And I think that this is one um, in which the DPC really shines. Um, what the bills are studying, what the CEC is trying to study at a broad level, what the NRMN new studies are going to push the boundaries on and help us understand, um, and the Coordinating Center helping to do that as well, um, and then continuing to support folks through things like the Resource Center and, and the programmatic build um, efforts. Um, this is really a place where I think the DPC is a, a real great consortium for, for advancing the scholarship. So we wanted to also, as Sylvia and Rick both mentioned, this was the first uh, consensus report that was also challenged with making the report accessible and usable to scholars and practitioners. So the next slide shows um, how to access the report, but I've made a highlight here on the online guide. Um, on the next slide, show you the online guide that we built. Um, this is the report, both condensed and easy to access. Um, and so um, we hope you all read it cover to cover. Um, but we know that the likelihood of that out in the wild is unlikely. Um, and so this is a way to make it um, much more accessible. I really encourage the consortium and all of the partners to get this in front of uh, your participants and your leaders. Um, this has stuff it's for undergrads, it has stuff for grad students, it has stuff for faculty, it has stuff for administrators, for leaders, and for funding agencies. Many of those things are in the tools and all of the recommendations um, and specifics on how to develop a culture of mentorship. Um, this is a way, again, to raise your own efforts in their visibility and to leverage um, for continued change and support. So I think the final slide is just if you dive into the online guide, um, you can see examples like possible actions for research, training, and graduate program directors. These are very concrete, specific things that programs can do. Um, what, I, what I did right away is I went right in here and I said, okay, what are we doing at Wisconsin? And what are we doing in NRMN? Uh, and what are we doing um, in the other work um, that we're involved in? So we could highlight where we were making progress and we could leave blank where we were and start to talk to um, those in our ecosystem about where we could start moving towards change. 
this might be a really fun activity um, for us to think about across the consortium is what does it look like as a collective um, across all of these recommendations, um, and I think that could be a cool opportunity. So I know that was quick and fast, but I wanted to leave five minutes for a couple questions, um, as well as for Cynthia to close us out. So I will end my part and turn it over to you, to, to you Cynthia. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you uh, who presented, uh, Sylvia, Rick, and Chris, um, some incredible information and lots of uh, opportunity to further look into and access that information through the report and through all the efforts that you've made to make it usable and workable. There is one question um, that I've received here, and it really is a first step question. A uh, person wanted to know as an individual, if you want to improve your membership sk mentorship skills, what would be the first step that you should take to uh, in, in all of this information, the recommendations of uh, at least one speaker, if uh, we have time for two or three, that'd be great too. Oh, Rick and Sylvia, let me take it, please. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'll, I'll give just three examples. I think one is um, there are very concrete things directed at mentors in the National Academies toolkit and I would go there because they link out to many of the first step opportunities that are available nationally. That includes um, the things offered by the NRMN Resource Center. That includes um, self-paced online mentorship training that they could start with as well as things to just read. And then the second piece or the third piece to that is I would say is I would look locally you will be shocked at how many uh, mentorship education opportunities exist on your own campus that you were not aware of. Um, they need to be expanded. Many campuses need to do it at a much more centralized and um, expansive level. Um, but I would look because oftentimes there are some incredible programming on your own campus that you don't know about. So those would be my three quick things that I would do first. Thank you so much for those um, practical steps. We have one more question here. Do you have a sense of how applicable these findings may be to early professionals? Anyone on the uh, presenter team like to field this question? <laughs> well, since that's kind of my day job, um, I would <laughs> love to, I mean, everything is totally applicable. Again, we were, you know, we were, you know, bounded by, you know, a, a task that was make it be somewhat, you know, a, you know, manageable, but everything that, in my opinion, everything, every principle, every activity, everything there, actually, if anything, becomes as as important, if not more important. You get to a postdoc level or a junior faculty level. You know, again, even where I'm working, and so I, I think it's absolutely applicable to the same principles. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, I, I recognize our time is valuable. I want to end on time. 10:57 is what I have. I want to let you know again this webinar recording is going to be publicly available on our homepage, and there's the web address for that. Do stop by. Um, that will be up, I would say, by a week from today. Thank you for giving us a little bit of time to get that compiled. The uh, second thing I want to let you know is we run a monthly webinar series during the academic calendar, so we will run through May this year. Our next topic is student wellness and resilience. I'm working with some uh, experts in this field to uh, get them to speak to us next uh, month, February 21st. And I, this is really aimed at giving a background in research as well as practical tools for uh, um, groups uh, or uh, programming that's taking place on the ground or individuals who want to support student wellness and resilience in their mentees, so it does link nicely to today's topic. And one final um, notice, this is National Mentoring Month, and on the uh, January 30th, we are uh, basically posting all day, thank you to your mentor. We are going to be uh, hosting this as an entire consortium on um, our social media sites, so Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you take a picture of you and your um, uh, mentor or mentees 
and want to market hashtag uh, thank your mentor day. We'd all appreciate that, getting a lot of traffic, and we want to get that trending uh, uh, as much as we can to emphasize all the importance in a practical way of what we've heard today. I just want to say thank you for all of the folks who joined online. We had a uh, total of 102 call-ins or logins, which is an all-time record for us. We look forward to seeing uh, many of you in the future, and I uh, just want to say thank you for your attention to this wonderful topic. We are signing off. Mentoring matters. Thank you so much. <laughs>